Hello and welcome to running Ansible at scale. So I thought it best I introduce myself quickly, or actually the whole talk is about me, so buckle up, okay? I'm just going to talk about me for the next 30 minutes. Uh, no, joking. So <laughs> I've been in a 20, 25 years in the IT industry. I first had a sysadmin role back in 98, uh, you know, as a Unix admin. And of course, Unix ain't so much of a thing anymore. It's all Linux, right? Okay, but I've been a solutions architect at Red Hat now for two years. Um, and in those two years, I must say, we've seen tremendous growth at Red Hat. I think when I started, the office was half empty. You know, maybe a glass half full, half empty. I'm a half empty kind of guy. Um, but now, there's, and there was half the, half the office space was available. Now it's full. Okay, so we've seen tremendous growth and the headcount's doubled, basically. And it's good to be part of a growing company like that. Uh, up here, I've got that I'm a gearhead, and you might be asking what that means. I like pulling things apart. I'm a tech at heart, okay? And as I said, a sysadmin since 98, so I like seeing how things work, and I like putting them back together and making them work again after I've pulled them apart. But the thing I like most that has gears is mountain biking, too. So if you're a mountain biker, and you want to come and talk about mountain biking and share some trail stories after this, come and see me at the booth. Okay, so back on topic, why am I passionate about Ansible? And that's because I think Ansible gives us the freedom to do the things we like doing, okay? It allows us to be more human. And to bring that to life, uh, so I've been running these link light workshops, and I think, you know, just dotted throughout the audience here, there's a few people that would have attended those. And those workshops, sometimes we get up to 60 people attending them. And each student that attends the workshop gets five instances each in the cloud. And we teach them how to use Ansible on that, okay? But I, I need to build those labs before I turn up the course and run it. So what I do is I come home the night before, I get my laptop out, and I hit the enter key on a playbook, and it goes and provisions the lab. And while I do that, I go and make tea, or I bath some kids, or go and play with them, or whatever it is, while that's provisioning, and I come back half an hour later, and it's done, okay? So that's why I like automation, because essentially in that little window there, it gives me the freedom to be a husband and a dad, okay? And that's sort of the goal. So also, when we think about automation, sometimes it can be taken out of context, okay? And some people think that automation is going to replace them, but it's not actually the the truth, okay? If we think of automation, we all think, oh no, we're going to automate my job away, but the truth is that automation, it doesn't write itself, okay? We as individuals have the knowledge about what it is we manage, we all have day jobs, okay? And we all have that knowledge that we have to translate into automation, and so you're just sort of changing the way you do things, it's not replacing. Okay, so that's me. Um, so I want to just click forward here, but I didn't, I clicked the laser. So what are we going to be talking about up here today? What's the agenda? What are we going to be banging on about? Okay, so first of all, we want to go through what the critical pieces or components for creating a scalable automation are. Okay, what are the, the critical pieces? And then we're going to talk about how Ansible starts in an organization. What are the common, how does it get its foot in the door? How does it sort of start? What's the sort of genesis of Ansible in an organization? And inevitably, as we do that, how does it grow? And and what are some of the challenges that you encounter as you grow and your usage broadens and sort of grows organically, okay? What happens? Then we'll quickly go through a Git branching model for managing the software development lifecycle of Ansible content. Okay, and then I'll do a brief overview of testing release framework and that'll be pretty much the end. So there's lots to cover. There's lots of material to cover. It's fairly broad, okay? Uh, the technical depth is sort of hallway conversations, kind of most of the conversations I've been having today, to be honest. Uh, quick plug to a colleague in North America who gave me the inspiration for giving this talk and some of the content as well. So thanks to Sam Duran over there, Ansible, Ansible engineer in North America. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so what are the keys to building a scalable automation solution? So I can tell you that it's probably not what you think it is. So, it's probably not what you think it is, but these are the common parts that we generally see, okay? So, first of all, it is a problem of technology, okay? So, it's a technology problem. 
but it's also a problem of culture and people and processes, okay? And almost more importantly, because, you know, quite often people look at this, this problem of building a scalable automation platform and they think, you know, in order to solve this problem, and I, myself included, I'm guilty of this, I'm going to go grab a really big hammer, okay? And I'm going to throw technology at the problem and, you know, with this hammer, I can build the Taj Mahal, okay? It'd be unstoppable. But the truth is, right, that technology is only a small part of the picture, and technology only gets you so far. There's only so much you can do with it before you need to do something else, okay? But the bigger picture at companies, uh, with employees greater than or equal to sort of one, is that you have to get the culture right, okay? It's about the culture. It's, uh, <coughs> this morning we heard, you know, in the keynotes and some of the presentations this morning, we heard about open source projects and how they're delivered, okay? And they need communities to contribute to these projects and collaborate. Okay, and is that not a culture when people behave like that and they share and they give feedback? So we create a culture, okay, to develop Ansible content and, and we need to collaborate. We also need to perhaps develop new processes that help automation exist within our environment and some of these processes and things may not have existed or traditionally haven't been in the environment before. So we have to work out our new processes and how our automated procedures and practices will fit in with like our existing change management platform, for example, or our approval processes. Okay, and of course, there's people involved in all of that. So, the other thing that most people forget about when they're busy building an automation platform and they're trying to get stuff out the door, right, and they're all active and excited, okay, is the aspect of security. And I'm not talking about the security of the application or the operating system that it's running on <coughs> or the hardening of the SOE or firewalls or anything like that. I'm talking about the security team, okay? So we have to engage the security team whenever we onboard any new products in an organization. And you need to do that early, okay? You need to engage with the security team whenever you do any sort of projects or uh, delivery of projects like this at scale early. You have to... You know, how do I get approval from a security team to run an automation platform that has far-reaching access into my enterprise? How do I get that risk signed off? How do I get approval to do that? Okay, so you need to engage them early. You need to involve them in the decision-making process of onboarding a new piece of software. Um, you need to be able to explain to them how automation reduces risk overall, right? So ultimately, automation is going to make our jobs easier Okay, and you want to, by involving the security team early and engaging with them early, you're building them into the culture and ultimately you're building security into your culture, okay, so that you can operate more agile and faster with security baked into it. Make sense? Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about how Ansible starts in an organization. How does it get its foot in the door. So, usually what happens is we start off with a problem, okay? There's, a, there's, a, there's something to go out and solve, and we install Ansible on our laptop, and we write this one thing, and it fixes the problem. We run it. And then we run that same task again across a different server or a different router or switch, and it does the same thing again. And then you kind of scale it out, and you do the same task across a thousand servers, and you're like, wow, this is amazing, okay? And then what you do is you tell your coworkers, okay? You tell your peers, and they do the same thing. They all install Ansible on their laptops. And then we're all writing Ansible content together. And I'll share a, a playbook with my coworker, and they'll go to run it, and it won't work for them, right? And I'll look across and I'll go, oh, really? Well, it works on mine. And no one's ever heard that before, right? The justification is it works on mine, so it's your problem. Okay, so although it's nice that it's that it organically spreads. Uh, you know, inevitably, as we're running Ansible from our laptops, we've all got our individual installations of Ansible and all the supporting modules and code under each of those installations. There could be, you know, actual different versions of Ansible on someone's laptop versus another's. And, you know, some of the common libraries that we see problems are with the Bodo 3 that drives the Amazon API underneath Ansible. Okay, there's updates and things involved there. Uh, and the Ginger templating engine, there can be minor differences between versions of the Ginger templating engine and the module that supports that. 
Okay, and to, to carry that out a little bit further, as Ansible spreads and grows organically, uh, to where everybody's running Ansible from their laptops in the Windows team and everybody's running Ansible from their laptops in the networks team. You know, if, if you don't have a plan to manage all that, then very quickly your Ansible code can look like this. Okay? And no one wants to sort of reach their hand into that to run their enterprise, do they? Okay? Although it might taste all right, but it's not sort of very elegant and not really ready to run in your enterprise. Okay, so no one wants spaghetti Ansible, and that's kind of how that evolves. So if you, if you have a plan with how to create scalable Ansible, then that's a good thing. And so code structure and how to organize your content is one thing, but what are some of the other challenges besides running laptop Ansible from our laptops uh, when you get sort of more than six people running spaghetti Ansible like this? Okay, so some of the other challenges are that we need to have a secure way to store credentials. <laughs> okay, so in order to run those automations off the laptop, everyone's got to have credentials on their laptop. Okay, we, we really need to find a centralized way to share those credentials without storing the credentials on our laptops unencrypted at rest. Okay, so that's, that's bad risk. No security department wants you putting passwords to your far reaching into your enterprise on everyone's laptops in order to automate stuff. Okay. The other thing we need is a scheduler. So we have to have a way to run automation when we're not there. We have to be able to trigger automation to run out of hours, sort of at 3 a.m. in the morning. So, um, you know, someone might say cron's a great way of doing that out of hours, okay? But cron's kind of bespoke. If we, we configure cron from our laptops, it can be different from one to the next, okay? And, you know, it's not really very enterprise. It's not very elegant either. So we need a scheduler. The other thing we need is an API to programmatically be able to execute jobs. In other words, not have to, well, in other words, to let external things trigger the automation through an API, okay? Don't need to explain what an API is. Everyone knows what an API is, but you need a robust enterprise-ready API that does all the things you need it to do um, and act like glue within your enterprise so that you can trigger automations from it. You know, I want my monitoring system when it, when, it, when an alarm triggers at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, I want that alarm system to be able to call the API of something and trigger an automation to go and reboot a server, for example, or reboot a switch, whatever it is. The other thing we need is audit and logging capabilities, okay? If we're going to be running automation from our laptops and everyone running automation at once, yeah, take a picture. This, this is good stuff, all right? Um, <laughs> Now that's good, take pictures, okay? There's some good ones coming up that I definitely want you to take a picture of as well. Um, running out of time. So we need to, uh, yeah, with the detailed auditing and logging, we need to know who ran what, when, and where. If I'm gonna centralize my automation and not run it from laptops, I'm gonna be using a service account to log into things, but I still need to know who was running what, when, where, and how, okay? So these are some of the common problems encountered with building an enterprise automation system. And it turns out, that we have a product <laughs> that solves this really, really well. And it's called Ansible Tower, okay? It's, uh, it's got a beautiful web UI. Hands up who's used Ansible Tower in any kind of shape or fashion. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. So it's got a beautiful web UI, you've got the ability to pass in extra variables to your automation when they run. You can re create user surveys to prompt people for information when they run job templates and things like that. And with the API, uh, sorry, with the, with the way it stores credentials, you can put your credentials into Tower and still share them out without releasing what the details of the credentials are. And of course, to keep security people happy, it's got this full role-based access control to allow you to give people just enough access to things like credentials and inventory and playbooks to automate things, okay? And so, Ansible Tower ultimately helps you get security approval when you want to run automation at scale. And so let's talk again about how to get security on board, okay? When I'm going to be running this tool that has far-reaching access into my enterprise. So you have to think about how a security team thinks and how a business thinks, okay? And security teams are all about identifying, presenting, and mitigating risk. 
Okay, and then what they do is they present that to the business and the business has to sign off on that risk or accept that risk, okay? And so you can say to security teams that you're already, you've already got a team of systems administrators and people doing their day jobs. We're already logging into things via SSH uh, from our laptops, okay? But you can say, what I want to do is change that so that everyone's now running automation and now we're now running our jobs through a central service, and I'm going to use a service account to log into all my systems. And no doubt they're going to be like, whoa, no, you can't do that. We're, we're monitoring the endpoints, okay? And all of a sudden, we're going to be seeing anonymous access in our servers. And, um, you know, I won't be able to tell who it is, but you can actually say, you know what, it's, it's actually a good thing. I'm not introducing any new risk, okay? We went over. We're, we're still using native transports for Ansible, like OpenSSH and WinRM. I'm not installing any extra software, so I'm not creating any vulnerabilities, I'm not creating any extra lifecycle management, all I'm doing is just purely changing the way we're doing things today to go through a centralised system. So instead of introducing new risk, what I'm actually doing is reducing risk, okay? And the security teams are going to like those kind of words, okay? It makes sense, but you need to justify it. This is how you justify it. And so you can also explain to them that this is how... Um, you know, the big cloud companies, the hyperscalers, we call them, uh, do things. They have the security baked in to their automated release uh, of software and the way that they build things. And it's all baked in nicely. And now that we've got security engaged in our project early and we've explained all the risk, they're no longer a blocker or a final gatekeeper. They're now an enabler. Okay, so what's next? All right, and now I want to talk about this loaded word, DevOps, all right? And this word, I'll, I'll unpack it a bit, but I want, to, I want to define what it means in the context of de developing Ansible playbooks and roles. So to me, DevOps means it's that we're going to take, you know, we're going to take the, the practices, the procedures, and the d disciplines traditionally associated with software development, okay? And we're going to take them across to the operations side of the house. So we're going to bring things like version control and, and do code review um, and smoke tests and integrate all that, like the things we do in the dev side, and we're going to bring that across to the operations side of the house. Okay? I know when I first started out doing ops, uh, you know, I had my toolkit. I used to bring my toolkit on my laptop with all my scripts and all my snippets of code. I used to bring that to work, but you know, when I wanted to do something, I'd just run it, and I'd run it against production, and if it didn't work, I'd troubleshoot it until it ran and did the thing I wanted it to do. But I sure as hell wasn't doing version control on it, and I sure as hell wasn't doing continuous testing and delivery on it. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, bringing in, increasing the agility, like the, our ability to introduce change to our environment, that's being more agile, okay? We want to do it faster, so we want to increase the speed. We want to do small changes, but iterate through them quickly. Okay, and the only way to get that sort of level of capability is through using DevOps practices. Make sense? Okay, so we're just going to quickly talk about, now that we're on the topic of DevOps, we're just going to talk about a Git repository structure for Ansible code. Okay, so what, you know, to create scalable automation solutions, this is the sort of repository structure that I suggest you should start with. Okay, and the first thing I want you to notice is the hierarchy of the repository um, and the adjacency of everything to each other in there. Okay, so, so Ansible is an incredibly flexible tool but, and it lets us do really creative things in lots of different ways, but this is a really good starting point in order to lay out your repository. Okay, so you know, at the top here, I've got a group vars section you notice I've got the, the rep repository name at the top there, Ansible. I've got a group vars section. And in the group vars section is where I define my metadata for my automation. Okay, so the things like the variables and the pieces of stuff I want to go out and configure are all contained under that group structure. And if you place it in there, Ansible will always go into the group vars directory and resolve those file names based on the inventory that you're automating. Okay, and that Group VAR's structure for metadata transports really well from your development machine across to Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower, when it executes this repository for a project, will also import the data out of that Group VAR's directory. So this is a really good way to structure it. Okay, some people want to define 
you know, inventory variables in that file there, but Tower doesn't really do it that way. It does inventory differently. So if you do your metadata through group vars, transfers from the development workstation to Tower really, really well. Okay, so we've got a library directory in here, okay, and that's where our custom code goes. You know, stuff that doesn't come with the Ansible project itself or things that we've custom written ourselves goes in there and that'll just get automatically resolved and executed through runtime if it needs to. Uh, we've got a roles directory and Ansible roles, uh, you know, we store a lot of Ansible roles or pre-written automation in Ansible Galaxy, which most people have heard of, okay? And that's where our roles go. Okay, I'll get into what the requirements.yaml means in a minute. So we've got a, a git ignore, okay? So this is a git repository, which we're using for you know, software development version control. So we've got a git ignore file here, and what we do with that is we tell it to ignore the roles directory, or everything in the roles directory except requirements.yaml. And why do we do that? Well, we do that because we want our roles to be in separate repositories to our automation, okay? We want to be able to have other teams and other communities or whatever who are developing roles continue to do so and we just import those at runtime. And if you define what they are and where they come from, the roles in the requirements.yml, not requirements.yaml or anything else, just requirements.yml, that's what Tower will look for when it executes. It'll install everything using an Ansible Galaxy install based on the contents of that file into your environment and build the roles, use them and then tear them down. Okay, so by doing it this way, it allows us to separate our roles from our code and stop developing like this monolithic repository structure that contains everything. It's better to farm out the roles to a different repository so they can be changed and enhanced and version controlled and whatever through there. All right, so we've got an Ansible config. If we put the Ansible config, so Ansible, when it executes, it looks for this file in the current working directory. It looks for it in our home directory and it also looks for it in etc. Ansible. But if we put it in here, we get all the configuration required to support our automation with the repository when it executes. Okay, and that transfers really well if you're running Tower in a cluster. Tower will also use that Ansible config file to import the configuration for Ansible to execute as well. Okay, so often in a cluster we've got three and four nodes running things. But if you define your configuration in that file, you don't need to touch each box to make the config change, you just define it in there. And then, in terms of adjacency, we've got our playbooks down the bottom here, okay? Now, they're just arbitrary names, but notice the adjacency of these to the roles directory and the group vars directory. We could, some people like to create a playbooks directory here <coughs> and put their playbooks inside that, but then we're just gonna do a bunch of fancy linking of you know, the library and the roles directory into that directory and it gets a little bit messy, so this is our recommended approach, okay? And the adjacency to everything. So whilst we're on the topic of repositories, let's talk a bit more about Git and a development workflow, okay? And what that might look like in Git. So, um, you might want to take some photos of this one, or some notes, won't be on it too long, but this is pretty complex. I guess it can get pretty complex and kind of crazy, and the good and bad of Git is it doesn't really come with any structure. As we heard this morning, like open source technologies don't necessarily come with a, you know, a blueprint of how to do something. They're, they're open so that we can define how we want to cobble it together, okay? So, you know, we'll start here in this master branch, okay? And this is where change happens, okay? Notice the padlock. Okay, and what we do is we clone that off onto our development workstation. We take a clone of this repository and it doesn't have to be called master, it could be called develop or whatever you want to call it. And the Ansible project uses develop. Um, so we take a copy of that and we start making some changes, right? We've got some feature enhancements or some bug fixes to make and that's what these red dots represent. Okay, now be between each one we might go and have a cup of coffee or we might even go home, come in the next day and as we commit these to our local development machine, we've got those in its own branch on our development machine, okay? So we've checked out a new branch. And once we've got a good thing going on, we make a pull request, okay? You saw Sol, who was on stage this morning, he talked about git pull being the most important thing that anyone ever does these days, okay? And it's kind of true because at this stage, you know, I'm, no one's allowed to push into here um, because there's approvers involved in that. And 
you know, it's basically a fundamental change because once you start, you know, once you raise this pull request, it enables people to see what it is you're changing. It might send an email out to the approvers and tell them the diff of changes. They can get visibility, they can make comments, they can ask you questions, okay? Uh, before they approve it and before it gets committed. But as, as it gets pushed into this master branch, that's going to go and actually initiate change out across your environment. Okay, that's the automated bit. Okay, so we can make changes and commits and enhancements here, but this is the part where it gets serious. Okay, because once we make changes back in here, we need that collaboration, and we need people to review it. And once it's committed in there, it involves making change. Okay, and then basically, um, you know, it's quite a shift in thinking. Approvals are a shift in thinking; they equal change. So. This approach is called an upstream approach to version control, okay? So basically, once we make that, that's approved, the change then trickles downstream through these other environments, okay? Through a pull request. You know, that pull request involves another approval before it goes out. That pull request may reference a change request in our change management system, okay? But again, you figure out how you want it to work. And, you know, it all sort of just moves forward from there. So as we filter through each branch, the confidence of the change we're making, uh, you know, the level of confidence gets raised, and we know by the time it hits production, there's a high level of confidence that this change, because it's small, and that we've iterated quickly, is not going to break anything, okay? So there's less likelihood, if we do the upstream approach as well, there's less likelihood of breaking anyone, like, of introducing changes over the top. And as you can see, we can't push directly into these other branches, only the approvers can. So by using this upstream approach, we make sure that the one change filters through all the environments without making a change ahead of it or overriding it in the process. Okay? Cool, so repositories, um, so let's talk about mapping repositories to projects in Ansible Tower. Okay, and repositories in Ansible Tower are equal to projects. So in here we've defined a project that's obviously it's got a name and a, it's got a name up the top here. This one's dev and a location. And then we just define another one and this one's the test, okay? And it's defining that it's gonna access the test branch when it runs. Okay, so that's how we create projects that match our development model. And so we've got two different projects in Tower targeting different environments. And then what we do is we map the projects to job templates in Tower. Okay, so we've added our projects um, that point at our environment branches. So test, you know, dev, prod. Okay, and now we make templates the same. And we just, we just place the, you know, the dev playbooks with the dev template and that hooks the automation in with the environment and it hooks it in with the inventory that we're gonna run that environment across. Okay, so we make the job template to pick the dev project. So it's mapping projects to job templates. And then what we end up with in the end is, is three job templates that are targeting NTP in this example. And we've got, you know, I've also used labels because labels make it easier to go straight to these with a bookmark, okay? And it comes in handy when you're searching for, for things. But with it laid out this way, you can add permissions over the top and only enable certain people to run the prod job template or the dev job template, or you can hand it out to different organizations and through the RBAC capability, okay? Or you can trigger these to run through the API, through production and so on. Okay, just quickly, I mentioned the Ansible config file before, okay? And so this is, this is like a term in Ansible called forks, and forks equal the number of Python processes that are gonna run on a system when the automation runs, which ultimately equals concurrency. How many things can, can we automate at once, okay? So the recommendation is four gig of memory per 100 forks. So if I wanna have my playbooks run across 100 items, I need to have the memory for Ansible to be able to build all that automation and then automate things, okay? So it's just in inc increments from there, okay? But these are the most uh, common node sizes that we see. You can easily validate the performance of Tower and things through the API. And in summary, what we spoke about today is engaging security early, 
Okay, we want to create a culture of DevOps and a culture of automation that includes all the teams. And we went through the software development lifecycle and Git branching models and how they're undefined when you install Git and you go to build one of these. Okay, they're undefined. You need to come up with your development workflow and how that fits into your organization. We went over the up stream release strategy and how changes need to filter through your whole environment. You can't inject changes ahead of them. Okay, and then we also, uh, you know, we spoke about um, writing code that scales as well. Okay, so small changes that you can iterate through your environment more often, more regularly. Let the computers do the hard work, the heavy lifting and the processing for us. So hopefully that's been useful. And I mentioned light bulb workshops at the start of my talk, okay? And so come and see me and let's have a, have a talk about what they are and what they look like and how we get involved in that. Uh, you can come and talk to me about how Ansible might look in your environment or our booth. Uh, we, can discover what, we can run a discovery workshop with you around uh, weeding out use cases that are relevant to your business, okay? And, and get on, if you haven't tried Tower, there, you can go to that URL and you can download Tower and get a, you know, an evaluation copy of that today and start automating things tomorrow. So again, thanks for visiting Forum today and, and come and ask me a question. Thank you.